remember the first time you ever saw Earth from outer space. No humans before had ever seen that sight. And it looked so small and fragile and beautiful. And it permanently changed how we saw the Earth from that day forward. We saw it more globally and environmentally. Well, that's how I felt the first time I saw inner space, when I looked inside the brain of a living person with dyslexia. Wow! And as a teacher, I was very discouraged with the inconsistent literature on dyslexia at that time, and now a new way of seeing. At that moment, I said, this is what I'm going to do. So I went back to school to become a neuroscientist, not realizing I was at the beginning of this new field of educational neuroscience. Suddenly, we can see neuroscience through the eyes of a teacher and teaching through the eyes of a scientist. Well, everyone said, what kind of a job are you going to get? But I just did it for the love of it, and the romance is still going strong. But why do we need this new field? Well, we now know that it is better to learn a language early, and yet most students are not exposed to a foreign language until high school. It is not compulsory, and bilingual programs are often terminated early. We see that students are wired differently and have different strengths, and yet we expect all students to reach the same benchmarks. Research shows the importance of exercise on the brain and learning, and yet some schools are doing away with recess even at the pre-kindergarten level. I want to share with you today just three ways that I see that neuroscience can energize school reform through revealing underlying processes, through informing curriculum choices and interventions, and through creating a new bridge. First, recent neuroimaging studies are revealing some processes underlying skills such as reading and math. These processes may be invisible to teachers, but could be the culprit in learning difficulty. For example, some issues that appear to be math or reading comprehension problems are actually working memory problems. The student can't hold the information online long enough to work a complex problem or to remember a long sentence or paragraph. So rather than continuing to just drill on the math or reading behavior per se, we can also begin to address some of the underlying processes, such as poor working memory capacity. In a closely related process is uh, that of attention. Neville's lab found that mem working memory capacity was predicted by the ability to control attention, suggesting the importance of attention training to improve memory and achievement. Now, thirdly is one that I'm very involved in right now, and that is how does an underlying state of stress affect learning? particularly in popula populations suffering from poverty, violence, trauma, or natural disaster. Six weeks after I evacuated New Orleans from Hurricane Katrina, my co-author finally got contact with the outside world. And she emailed me, I'm not going to be able to work on the book. I got some kind of brain damage from Hurricane Katrina. And I told her, no, it's not brain damage. It's just the brain working differently because of the impact of stress and not working effectively on higher order tasks. But even though I knew what was happening to my own brain, it was a struggle. And I thought about my students and what the impact of stress may have had on their ability to learn. I will soon make my second trip to L'Aquila, Italy where the teachers and students have been impacted by the devastating earthquake. For those teachers, understanding what was happening to their brain gave them strength and coping strategies. So it's very important that teachers and students understand what is happening under stress and have some strategies for handling the effects of stress and trauma. 
This leads us to the second way in which neuroscience can energize school reform through informing curriculum choices and possibly interventions. You know, my mom gave me some great advice when I was in high school. I was trying to decide whether to take the college prep track or the business track. And she said, you know, you will always have a job if you learn shorthand. And I did, and I've always had a job. Great <laughs> advice. Now, I haven't really used the shorthand in decades, and some of you may not even know what it looks like. If we could go to the slide, whoever's it there, <laughs> what it actually looks like. So how do we make curriculum choices? Well, let's look at some insights from brain research. Petito says that we absolutely know that certain parts of knowledge are on a maturational level, and yet schools are flying in the face of biology. In 2011, she presented a study that showed that dual language exposure in infants gave the bilinguals a linguistic advantage over their monolingual peers by extending the sensitive period for learning language. Patricia Kuehl reported the importance of children hearing sounds in another language before six months of age to facilitate later language, language learning. But more importantly, she found that this effect did not occur if they were exposed via television or video, but only with real human interaction for the infants. Secondly, what if we could ameliorate the effects of poverty on achievement through targeted interventions? You know, socioeconomic status, SES, has long been associated with reading skills and achievement. Petito found that the lowest SES monolinguals performed like the high SES monolinguals when they were put into a 50-50 bilingual program. She finds that students exposed to two languages at the same time are blowing away their peers in achievement. In a groundbreaking finding with uh, implications for curriculum, Hel Helen Neville found that low SES students look like high SES in achievement and IQ scores went up after attention training. They kept the gains well over a year and still counting. Research results seem to indicate that if we want students to become better learners, we might be making some mistakes in some of the programs we're cutting out of the budget. Let's look at one example, music. Now we know that our students are going to need to be creative thinkers for the 21st century. A study from Vanderbilt University found that professionally trained musicians were more adept at creative thinking. And Gibson's lab found that the musicians had higher IQ scores than non-musicians, supporting other studies that indicate that intensive musical training is associated with higher IQ scores, reading and math scores. And yet, music is one of the first courses cut when the budget cuts are made. Another common curriculum cut under time or budget constraints is that of recess or physical education. And yet, Winter's lab showed that three minutes of aerobic activity improved both short and long-term memory. Several studies show the uh, relationship between physical activity on achievement and on standardized test scores. While there's not usually a direct link between neuroimaging studies and specific strategies in the classroom, once in a while that does happen. A fascinating study showed that the brain in doing mathematical functions uses finger representation like a child does when learning to do math. Well, uh, Noel's lab found that being able to tell which finger was being touched, called finger gnosis, predicted a person's mathematical ability. So Kaufman suggested not discouraging the use of fingers in those with mathematical difficulty. So who would have thought encouraging older 
children or adults to use their fingers to rewire that connection. The third way that neuroscience could energize school reform is by creating a new bridge through two-way interaction between scientists and educators. I'd like to suggest three steps toward that goal. First, medical students and universities work together to train scientists and teachers through cross-training to become educational neuroscientists. I see scientists leaving science for education and I know teachers who want to get involved in neuroscience. Now this new field got off to a rocky start, initiating and perpetuating some myths about the brain and there was controversy. Who's going to teach about the brain, scientists or educators? Well now, just about a decade after Brewer's Bridge Too Far, we have a new bridge with hybrid specialists, as Paul Howard Jones calls them with credentials in both fields. The second step toward school reform is to create laboratory schools similar to the teaching hospital model. Now, Kurt Fisher at Harvard is currently working on a model for this concept. In the meantime, we are seeing more researchers working with neuroscientists and doing research in the school, working with teachers in the school. The third step is to put an educational neuroscientist into every school system and college to do three things. First, to interface with scientists and inform their research from an educational perspective. For example, when I first started imaging dyslexia in the lab, dyslexia was characterized by a phonological deficit. But as a reading teacher, I saw other deficits in my students, and I saw subtypes. But when I brought that up in the lab at that time, I was told, soft science. But eventually, we did do a study with subtypes, small pilot study, but found some interesting results. So ed educators can help formulate the research questions, because research questions are limited by our own perspective and experience. The educational neuroscientist can also be a liaison between the university, the medical school, and the schools for research projects carried out in the schools. Furthermore, they can initiate and conduct research in-house to add to a larger database of research. Thirdly, the educational neuroscientist can provide credible information about the brain and learning to both teachers and students in a way that can inform practice. Now, I'm sure all the teachers here remember that early study where the teachers were told, you got the smart kids. And sure enough, at the end of the year, those kids performed better. But in reality, they had been given the lowest performing students. Their perceptions of their students affected the student's achievement. When teachers learn that the brain is plastic and what is required for learning to take place in the brain, they see their students differently. They believe that they can change. Now a student isn't a this or a that anymore, but a work in progress. We can stop with the labels and see students as works in progress. Students themselves improve when they learn about the brain. Blackwell's group did a study and they found that the students who were told how their brain learned and that they could change their brain had grades that went up while the others in the group stayed the same. He did another study of low performing teenagers, low achieving teenagers, and the group that was informed that they had some control over their learning and how their brain worked at grades that went up while the others continued downward. And that's what it's all about, empowered teaching and powerful learning. Parents and school bus drivers protested, and yet a brave principal in Covington, Louisiana, pushed back the school start time because he read neuroscience research that said adolescents need late morning sleep. Teachers struggle with standardized test scores, and some teach to the test. And yet, John Rady worked with a school in New York where they did exercise before school 
resulting in highly rated standardized test scores. Teachers are asked to do more with less, have less time, and face budget cuts. And yet, often on their own dollar, they flock to conferences to learn about the brain. So we are at the beginning of this new vision in which scientists, educators, and educational neuroscientists can all work together towards school reform. We need to stop thinking of school as a place, a building, or a classroom, and instead think of it like the brain, a distributed network, the scientists, educators, experts in the community. What an exciting time for educators to be at the beginning of this new frontier of inner space. The marvelous news is that, like the brain, our schools, too, are plastic. They, too, change as a result of experience. Are they where we want them to be? Not yet, not just yet. Thanks. <laughs>